Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Dr. Psych Mom Show. Today, I'm going to be talking about a common question that I get, which is how can you inoculate yourself against cheating, meaning what can you do to prevent yourself from cheating ever happening within your relationship? Uh, Before we get to that, I must tell you to subscribe. Um, My most recent subscriber episode is something I cannot honestly remember. Um, I bet it had to do with sex, though, or relationships, so let me check that out. One sec. Oh, I am back, and it is how come all your wife's friends also have sexless marriages. And when she tells you that nobody else has sex that's married, she's not lying, but there's a reason why. And you can uh, listen to that and 126 more if you subscribe. Only $8.99 a month, which is less than most Audible books for a lot of content. Okay, so how can you prevent infidelity? You cannot, so you just can't. So, I mean, (laughs) I don't know how many different ways to say it. I tried to say it on a video. People get very upset. So, like, for example, let's just zoom out. If somebody, God forbid, gets into a bad car accident, let's say their child is hurt in a car accident, the first thing everybody will say is, were they wearing their seatbelt? Plenty of kids get hurt when they're not when they are wearing their seatbelt too, by the way. But it, it's this common human thing to exert control, to give yourself the illusion of control, to be able to say, Well, I always make my kid wear their seatbelt, so therefore let's hope that it's something that I don't do, e.g. allow my child to not wear a seatbelt. Um, and therefore I can tell myself that then my child will never get into a car accident and get hurt. Right, So we all try to do this as humans. It's to reduce cognitive dissonance about the idea that we really are in charge of really not that much. And we have only a limited amount of control over our lives. And this is something that AA and religion get right. You know, I am, I am a part of neither. But, you know, it, it is, it's true. You know, there is a higher power than yourself. And whether you believe that's God or just like the entropy of the universe, it doesn't matter. You can't really control anything. You can do certain things to make it more or less likely. But I'll tell you, I talk about this show a lot. Um, I don't remember what the hell it was called. Decoys or something. It was like in the 90s or the 2000s. It was like awesome trash TV. And it was about these women that wanted to see if their husbands would cheat. And so they got like these like hot women. They like paid them to sit down next to their husband, you know, at a conference or something and talk about his favorite sports team while wearing like a push-up bra and like his favorite perfume and leaning in and touching his leg. I mean, those guys didn't have a fucking shot. They didn't have a shot in hell. They were sitting ducks, you know. And while a lot of guys listening to this would be like, oh, no, I would get up, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, you you don't know, you know, because everybody that I've worked with in therapy before they cheat was somebody who never thought that they would cheat with very, very rare exceptions, rarer as my career goes on because uh, infidelity is less and less socially approved of as time goes on, you know, so you can't really inoculate yourself fully against um Oh, I mean, think about it like this, you know, like, so, so your husband, did you ever watch the show The Affair, which I tell everybody to watch over and over? Now, I, I actually, I feel bad ruining any part of any show that anybody could really like. So I just will not tell you anything about it, except that you should watch The Affair. But I mean, eponymously, you know, you know, there's going to be an affair. And those people didn't think they were going to have an affair, you know, because shit happens. Like, life changes or an illness or a death or you like look at your partner and you realize they don't really even love you you know or you think you realize that and then you feel like time is ticking and you know there's like time in a bottle is playing and then like the right person hits on you while you're drunk and then what happens you know so I'd say that honestly the very very first step toward any even partial inoculation of your relationship against infidelity is understanding that you have much less control than you think. And therefore, you should be aware of your particular triggers that might make you lapse. If you continue with the kind of narcissistic frame that you are above reproach, and unless you're just a complete aromantic, asexual being, uh, then sure, you're not going to cheat because why the fuck would you? You know, like you would have no purpose doing that. But like, like if I hate money, I'm not going to rob a bank. But for anybody who is romantically and sexually motivated, you really have to think kind of what are my triggers. And the one that you can best do something about 
is, uh, well, a couple of them. Marital dissatisfaction, although the majority of people who cheat, especially men, say that they are happily married. So it really has not much to do with whether you're happily married. However, you know, for women who are, uh, I specifically see for women that are very unhappy, v women cheat at very low rates. And I just wrote a post about that. Um, it's called uh, Women Don't Usually Cheat. So you could look at that on drpsychmom.com. But when they do, because women don't have as high sex drives as men, they're motivated largely by the children once they have children. Um, and especially as perimenopause and menopause, you know, loom, as, as age increases, just the rates just drop, you know, and the rates start out at half of men anyway. So and anyway, the, the point being, for the few women that I do see that cheat, there's one of two things happening. It's either um, a real issue with mood and personality, such as borderline personality uh, or narcissistic personality, or they're like extraordinarily lonely in a marriage where like the man won't even really touch them. So kind of like the situation in Lisa Taddeo's book, Three Women, where like the woman, uh, she couldn't even get her husband to kiss her. And then she had an affair. So, you know, things have to be really bleak or the woman has to be kind of disordered is really the TLDR on that. Um, whereas for men, you know, there could be all, 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 all manner of reasons really that they do it because they have more testosterone. So which means they take more risks and they're more sexually motivated. So for a guy, he has so so for a woman Feeling closer to your husband could be partial inoculation, of course, if the right romantic man swept into your workplace and, you know, you guys are just chatting and he likes all the same music as you, you know, like you, you don't really know what you're going to be tempted to do, right? Nobody really does. Before anybody does anything in, uh, unforgivable, they always are, think that they're the kind of person who would never do that. So that's just something for an adult to make peace with is... Kind of, we don't know what we don't know. We don't know what's going to make us feel a certain way under certain circumstances. However, you know, there are ways to partially l limit the chances, such as knowing what your personal triggers are. If you're a guy who acts real different when he drinks, I mean, don't stay overnight at conferences if you could help it, you know. Tell yourself, hey, I'm the kind of person who would be really tempted when I was drunk to sleep with somebody else. Like, let that be in your consciousness instead of telling yourself you would never do it. Because this is how I work with sex addicts. Because I, I do work with a lot of guys who struggle with sex and porn addiction. And, and this is not a guy who wants sex, you know, every day with his wife. As I've discussed so many times, a sex addict is somebody that puts his marriage, his job, etc. on the line. Uses hours and hours of porn. Has usually gotten hookers. You know, it's like a whole thing. Sex workers, whatever we call them. I say hookers with love. Doesn't matter. Um, either way. These, these, these people are not um, the guy who just wants sex with his wife all the time. So they're struggling in the grips of an addiction. And it's really a dopamine releaser and, and a substance in the same way that alcohol or drugs would be. But anyway, when, when we work on not cheating, we work on knowing what your triggers are. For most of those guys, it's honestly being alone with a woman. So don't be alone with a woman. You know, try, try not to be alone with a woman. You know, I mean, if you're headed up in an elevator with a hot woman, I don't know. I don't know if the force will be with you or not. I mean, you know, it, shit happens. But, you know, in, 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 in any, I mean, and the elevator gets stuck, some bizarro situation right out of the movies or something. But in a normal situation, what these guys try to do is say, oh, all right, so I'm not going to go to lunch with women anymore. I'm not going to go to lunch with coworkers that are women. I'm just not going to do that one-on-one. -on -one. I'm not going to get drinks with my boss. She's a woman. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to get drunk when I go, uh, you know, to work events. No, the work party. I'm not going to get drunk. I may, I may not even go. You know, so the more, it's, it's ironic, the more that people understand that they might cheat, the less likely they are to actually do it. The people where it blindsides them are the people that are like these, you know, kind of smug about how they would never do such a thing and they judge the fuck out of everybody that does. And then they get blindsided. They got no recourse. They have no plan of action because they were convincing themselves over and over that this would never happen to them, et cetera, et cetera. Frequently, and this is ironic, a lot of these people were impacted by the infidelity of a parent, right? So they say, oh yeah, I'm never going to cheat on my wife, never going to be a prick like my father. He slept with all these women, had a lot of affairs, never going to be like that. 
What happens though? He, you have half of that man's DNA. If he was an impulsive, risk-taking, sensation-seeking, addictive kind of guy, well, shit, you know, I mean, you, you, you may be as well, you know, and when you're under the right circumstances and you have no game plan because you've only told yourself, I will not, I am not bad like him and, and thought in these very black and white, primitive, childlike kind of uh, dichotomies you know, then, then you're, you're fucked, you know, you are SOL because you don't have any kind of game plan when the woman sits down with the perfume and touches you on the leg because you never thought you would be tempted despite how truly ridiculous that is when you really put it out like that. Of course, any human could be tempted, you know, and, and if you're tempted and the person says and does all the right things, not because there's some succubus or some seductress or some seducer, but because, like, you and them click, they too are an imago. You know, like, you could have a lot of imagos. So imago as you know, I don't have to reinvent the wheel. Google that term on my site if you don't know what it is. If you, somebody similar to your caregiver in a way that subconsciously motivates you to want to click with them and they feel like home, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there's a lot of people like that. And so if you're in a marriage where you don't really feel understood, and guess what? There's like no secret sauce to make your marriage to somebody who's more attractive than a potential cheater, a potential cheating partner, rather. So if you're feeling un, unloved, ununderstood, sure, work on your marriage. But does that mean that you still will not meet somebody who you ever click with a little bit better? What the hell? Of course you can't. So you need to have maybe a game plan that says, you know what, I am at risk. Every human's at risk of cheating, right? So, except as I said, the asexual slash aromantic, because why, why would they? But, um, you know, what would my game plan be? And then some people think when they do this thought experiment, they have a very taboo thought, which is, fuck it, you know? I'm not happy. <laughs> I'm not happy in this marriage. And if that woman sat down next to me and she also liked the Packers and she put her hand on my leg, she wouldn't even have to like the fucking Packers. <laughs> you know? And and in that case, you know, you are truly at risk for infidelity now or later. So at that point would be when you would really want to reevaluate your marriage. You know, and say, do I really want to be in this marriage? And or can I hopefully and First, can I work on it? Can I work on feeling closer and more connected so that I don't think, fuck it, you know, which a lot of unhappily married people do. Now, the happily married people, they got the ones who cheat, which there are many. That is a majority because the number one reason people cheat is to feel alive, not to not because they hate their spouse, you know, but um, the, the number one thing, you know, that that people have to think about when they're happily married is to focus on what they would destroy. And sometimes that can be sobering. Like a lot of people are like, oh my God, my wife would just, she, she would be so upset. Yes, she would, man. But guess what else would happen? She would stop being so sad. Then she would get really angry. Then she would get the lawyer that her sister told her about. Then she's going to take half of everything. The kids are going to ally with her potentially because you screwed somebody else. Your mother would be mad at you. Everybody would be talking to her more than you. Like sometimes when you really walk through some of this shit, then it can also help people who are in the throes of almost beginning an affair not begin an affair because they haven't ever really thought about all of the consequences you know they've just gotten to the place where their wife slash husband would be so sad and that's very bad but it's not quite as bad as you would only get to see your kids half the time and probably they wouldn't want to come over to your house then either in a worst case scenario because you left mommy for your secretary you know that sort of thing so the, to summarize everybody is at risk for cheating every single person if you think about it like that, I mean, it makes sense. Like everybody's at risk for a car accident. The perfect storm of, of events, you know, could happen. That's, that's the, the truth. So everybody's at risk. People, it, it, another interesting, ironic thing is that the people that I work with that seem the most reasonable about this and actually do practical things to stop themselves from cheating are prior cheaters. So sometimes like in my Facebook group, which y'all should join, it's very interesting. Um, lots of discussion. People say, uh, is it true once a cheater, always a cheater? That was a thread. And I said, definitely not. I mean, people could stop smoking crack. You know what I mean? So obviously they could stop being a cheater. And frequently they are uh, exactly the people who can know how to do that. You know, I mean, shit. It's like that guy, that uh, personal trainer who gained like 100 pounds and then he lost it so that he could tell his clients that he had been there and he actually knew about weight loss. I thought that was pretty, you know, smart, right, as a marketing tool. But, um, 
you know, if, if you've been there already, then you don't have any illusions. It's like people in their second marriage. They don't have any illusions about how perfect they are. You know, so frequently they want to work harder on themselves and, and um, you know, and, and understand their partner better with fewer illusions, right? So if you've already cheated, you don't have any illusions about yourself. So you're like, oh, I'm the sort of person who should not go out and get drunk at parties. That, that's me. I'm that kind of person. I'm the kind of person who cannot be trusted when I've had too many drinks to talk to an attractive member of the opposite sex. I just can't. So the more that you know, the more that you can help yourself in that domain. And uh, similarly, if you are somebody who is very emotionally motivated, I shouldn't have, you know, deep conversations with guys at work, you know, just really shouldn't do that because that makes uh, me feel more unhappy in my marriage and it makes me start having sex dreams about that guy and then, you know, who the fuck knows what could happen. In my last marriage, I had an emotional affair. I don't want that to happen again. That would be what a woman would say in this situation. Because, and don't make make no mistake, for women, an emotional affair is a big deal. A lot of guys think if it's not physical, it's not a big deal. If she's in love with somebody, that's a bigger deal than if she had a one-night stand to her. To her. She's she's at more risk for for leaving if she has an emotional affair than a one-night stand, which is what guys don't really necessarily realize. They're looking at it from the other perspective. But anyway, that's just an aside. So uh, this is an interesting one to think about. And if you are one of the few people whose spouse wants to listen to my stuff, because again, don't force it down their throats. Take what you can and start conversations if they don't like to listen to my podcast. Not everybody likes to listen to my podcast. You know, I'm, I'm not a universal like, you know, because I am straightforward, etc. cetera. Uh, but, you know, the point is you can start a conversation like, you know, what do you think would um would would be a risk factor for you for cheating. Now don't do this if you're like Mr. Preoccupied Attachment who like brings this up like 17 times a day like over coffee. Like, "Oh, hey, cheated on me yet today?" Like then just like never ever talk about it. But if you're like somebody else who actually wants to like, you know, bring up a new topic and learn more about somebody, you say, "Did you were you ever you know, somebody who thought that you might cheat or that you would like never cheat. Or if you did, like, what do you think that risk factors would be for you? You know, it's an interesting conversation, you know, and a lot of people in their second marriages have had it because they've lived longer and they've had more things happen, you know, and people who have had infidelity in a prior marriage generally talk about this in the early stages of a new relationship. You know, in terms of how they're not going to have that happen again or they don't want it to happen again and this is what they do differently, et cetera, et cetera. It's an interesting conversation. But you know what? If your spouse really doesn't like to talk about these kind of things, you just think about it, you know, because if your spouse, I mean, really, quite definitionally, if your spouse is somebody who doesn't like to talk about things on a deep level and you are somebody who listens to this podcast, then not for nothing, you may be a little bit more at risk than you think because you're already feeling emotionally lonely. So think about ways that would be you to, to inoculate yourself even partially, as I said, which is as good as we can get against the potential of infidelity, you know, which is, which is a terrible thing to do to somebody. And in, in a worst case, you know, it is better, it is usually better to leave. And I say usually because then I have these guys who are in their 60s that tell me, yeah, I slept with women on business trips years ago. My wife never found out. And I don't know, you know, she kind of doesn't want to know. She never really asked so much what I did. There's different cultural and generational influences on this kind of thing. But in the majority of cases for my listeners in their 40s and 50s, your partner really does not have a don't ask, don't tell probably and just really would be terribly hurt. Um, and so you shouldn't do it. And so therefore you should think about your own potential triggers in a very open and honest way for yourself. All right. I'll talk to everybody soon, guys. Have a great day.